All right, it's five o'clock. We might as well get started. I'm SLP, this is Watch Me Work, where we get to talk with you about your work and your creative process. We've been doing this show for about 14 years. We started in the lobby of the public theater and we have uh, then we moved uh, on to Zoom during COVID and we've been on Zoom ever since. And what we do is we work for 20 minutes together. Uh, you can work on anything you want. You can work on writing or music or a dance piece or whatever, cause it's Zoom and you can just do whatever you want. And uh, then after 20 minutes, we will talk with you about your work and your creative process. And while we do not have the time for you to actually share your work, like read from your work or show us your dance or whatever, um, we do have the time to talk about process, your creative process. So you'll ask me questions about your process and I'll do my best to give you some of my thoughts. If you want to ask questions about your work or your creative process, you can, we can hear how to do it from Lolly. Take it away. Yeah, so if you're here on Zoom with us and you want to ask a question, you can use the raise your hand function, which is in the reactions tab, likely at the bottom of your screen. If you have any trouble finding it, just let me know in the chat and I can help you out. And then if you're watching live with us on HowlRound, you can ask your questions via the Public Theater's Twitter or Instagram accounts or via the Watch Me Work Twitter account, which is at Watch Me Work SLP with the hashtag HowlRound. That's hashtag H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D. Awesome. Thank you, Lolly. And we will, yeah, before we get started, we'll give a big, huge thank you to the Public Theater and to HowlRound for sponsoring us and helping us make it happen. And now we'll get to work. Here we go. Boom.
Yay. Okay. Time for the Q&A. Uh, wondering if anybody's got any questions. Oh, looks like Steve has a question. You should be able to unmute, Steve. Great. Hey, Steve. Hi, Susan Laurie. I'm not I'm not sure how all to call you. I have so much love and oh. uh, just thank you for the gift of this, uh, the grace. Thank you, Steve. That's so, cool. That's wow. so kind. Thank you. Wow. Glad you're here. Uh, I uh, I do want to say I'll, I'll show my aid. I, norm I normally be reticent to do it, but I actually was. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I just do this because I have a lot of street noise outside. Oh, e excellent, excellent. And I have rain, so okay. we're we're in bad balance. Uh, um, I'm in D.C., Washington D.C. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I'll go get to the work question, but just I wanted to say that I have the gift of uh, being in the audience for Top Dog on Broadway, and it was a it was a real a thrill and joy. So thank you for for the love and the gift and the giving. Um, exquisite. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank, yeah. You thank you so much. Um, so I've been working on a piece that I see as allegorical, um, or I. I, I I, I maybe I, that's too much of an imprint already, but um, it's based in a historical uh, moment uh, during the 60s um, and during a, the voting rights uh, kind of, un, you know, kind of fragility of things, if you will. Um, uh, an incident that happened in my hometown in DC. And, and so I've been carving this out, uh, going through the due diligence as it were of this. Uh, um, and a couple of things have been, probably distracting thoughts, but having, you know, uh, done this a little while and iterations as an actor and as a producer and different things. So I, I, I sometimes think about, you know, you know, who, who will direct the process of directing. I studied briefly with Lloyd Richards yeah. and Mr. Richards kindly shared in one of our scene classes, Mr. Richards said to me, he, one, one of the things he, he guided us through Raisin in the Sun and he, he, I was working on streetcar at the time as, as 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 Mitch, but the point is, he was saying with Lorraine that they worked together on the work, you know, in Philadelphia and a lot of places, working out the work, right? And so for me, one of the things I'm I'm like, okay, who finding? And I I, I go to the theater and I'm I'm watching work locally and seeing someone with whom as you're trying to incubate the work is its own curious conundrum even in the process and i'm wondering how you might speak to that yeah yeah, yeah. that's a great that's a great question steve um it's funny i was just talking to a, a good friend today about you know the workshop process and all that and hmm um i agree with lloyd to say it's tricky i agree with mr richards and I also maybe perhaps more strongly believe that if the writer does their work to the very best of their ability, then the question of who shall direct it is not as crucial. Because, because um, you know, then we're, I, I really think that, that we, as if you're the writer, that, that writers need to really like dig in there and get as much work done as they possibly can, not on their own, because workshops are very helpful. Wonderful actors getting on board are very helpful. Wonderful directors are certainly very helpful. And still to depend on the director, you know, to provide all those kinds of things that we're, we're not doing on our own is, is maybe, I, I think sometimes, uh, I, I think we're, I think it's maybe too much of a burden to place on them. That's what I think. So um, that being said, there are what's great about now is there are tons of great directors out there 
who who are to choose from. You know, I think a lot of the directing programs have turned have turned out a lot of wonderful directors um, who would be perfect. And you can look at. I mean, you, you you come to New York, you see plays. You live in D.C. There's some great directors coming through there who you could just look at and you could go to a play and say, well, that play feels kind of like my play, you know, it's edgy, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. political, it's, it's exciting. That could be a director for me. Um, certainly when you find, anyway, so I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of saying two or three things at once, but go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, 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 I I'm so thankful for you to take in the, the questions most sincerely. It's just I'm, I'm trying to stay with my head in the ground, as it were, with with whatever this is going to reveal. And yet the uh, child in me with the toy of sorts, I guess, and just, you know, I'm going, OK, so, you know, uh, where, you know, where, where who, who can I? Because I've even seen your workshop when you were working with Jeffrey and um, uh, in, in workshop before Mountain with um uh with mr wolf so i've, I've right. seen that process with you even of pages and going back and forth and it it seemed fruitful to you in, in the moment oh, yeah. i wasn't in your head <laughs> definitely, <laughs> but, definitely 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 steve and just to remind you and just the very first um two readings of top dog underdog were directed by me so I was even going to broach that, but I was like, is that, that's yeah. probably wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say so. First, the, yeah, the very, the very first public reading ever of it was held uh, in a little rehearsal room in the public theater with, um, oh boy, uh, Jonathan Peck and Michael Potts as, Link, as Lincoln and Booth. And then we had a, 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 a staged reading uh, at the New York Now Festival, which was also in the public theater. And uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson was Lincoln and Jeffrey Wright was Booth. And I directed those two. So I was leaning on me, you know, and that was, and not that, you know, I was taking notes from, you know, George and, 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 you know, the uh, Heidi and Jordan, who was a cast, you know, folks, you know, I was taking, John Diaz was there, Bonnie Metzger was there. So there were people giving me notes, sure. But I was leaning on myself as a director because again, and that's something you might do. The first reading, you might you might say, "I'm going to direct this." I mean, again, it was the first reading was a sit down reading, actors with scripts, you know, script in hand. The second reading uh, was they it was staged, but it was script in hand. Um, that might be something that you might try. Thank you for listening. You know, you know, you know. But again, I, I'm just encouraging uh, the the. The, the primary generative artist, in this case, you, the writer, to do the work, do, go ahead and do the work. Um, I meet, I gotta say too many writers these days who will kind of write a draft, kind of, sort of, and then look for a director to help them and look for a bunch of actors. I've heard actors say, yeah, um, the draft wasn't really finished. And then we came in and told the writer what the, the characters might say, things like that. And that's OK. That might be a writer's process. But I encourage the writer to do, the, do as much work as they can on the script. Will do. Um, yeah. Yeah. OK. But, but go ahead. You know, you can direct the first reading yourself. That could be yeah. fun, yeah. you know? Absolutely. And with the dramaturg there or the producer there or whatever, you know, get feedback from the actors, all that sort of stuff. That could be fun. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome, hon. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Lori has a question. You should be able to unmute. Thank you. I'm going to echo what Steve said. I waited almost 20 years to see Top Dog Underdog after I read it, and I saw it in New York. And uh, just thank you for writing the perfect piece. <laughs> so it was like a dream come true. I was telling everybody, the ushers, everybody. <laughs> so. yeah, thank you. 
Um, my, my question is, I'm just going back to school, uh, starting my MFA in playwriting, even though I've been writing for about 15 years, and I'm studying the farce, and I'm writing my first farce. Oh, wow. And one of the things I'm having a real challenge with is I've read a lot, um, but I can't really find sources that I can see. You know, and, and a lot of places just sometimes, you know, I've been reading a lot of articles, a lot of places aren't doing them um, as much. So my, my question is on process, do you have any suggestions on either other media or other ways or other things to be, that I can start exploring to visually see some of these comedic elements, particularly right now, I'm kind of working on the setups. So that's my, that's my question. Right, right, right. Um, so when you read these plays right um you want you it would be more helpful for you to actually see them staged i mean that's what you're asking you can't there's no place for you to see them um what about in film now sorry uh it's okay um yeah, now I can unmute. Yeah. I found snippets of films, particularly, uh, you know, some of the, the earlier farces, but I really have had a challenge uh, finding a full production. Uh, right, I've, right. I've seen the, some of the classics, you know, Boeing, right. Boeing, Noises Off, um, but right. I'd really right. love right. to, especially the setups, you know, right. and kind of analyzing it. So, right. So, but you've read a lot of them. I think you have to use the venue. I mean, I, I, I you know, productions are, are, you know, I think we're, we're, we can only see what's being put out there. You know what I mean? So if it's not, if it's, there's Lincoln Center film, uh, theater on tape, maybe they have, you can go to the Lincoln Center library. If you live in New York, or if you visit New York, you can do that. Um, or you can just use the venue in your head and just imagine them, especially if you're just looking at the setups, you know, um, then you just, you just are looking at a very specific portion of the show um and you're just gonna have to imagine it in your head you know um yeah yeah it's a great question though but lincoln do you live in new york Lori? okay you don't yeah yeah okay yeah um they they, they new york uh, uh the theater on tape tape or yeah. theater on film or whatever it's called it they might have an online component now i i don't know okay. um they, they might have it's a library so they might have an online component I'll, you know? I'll definitely check it out thanks and we we try and get there at least once a year i'm down in Asheville. Oh, okay uh, so um yeah I, I will definitely check that out thank you so thank much you, great question thank you I have, a, I have a question for Lori. How long is a setup traditionally? Like noises off. Like how many pages is that? Uh, I don't have it right here with me, but um, so okay. for the uh, depending, I, I've just done a, a a pretty decent paper on this. It's it's about eight pages, but it depends on what elements are being set up. You know, so for example, the relationship uh, that really uh, starts the action of the two couples you know, mm -hmm. get, getting things confused can be anywhere from three to five pages. Some of the setups in um, She Stoops to Conquer, which is a, a mm -hmm. much older piece, you know, the setup is a little, they, and they had more characters then. Mm -hmm. uh, the setup, uh, particularly when we're going to get into the mixed identities, uh, mm -hmm. is uh, probably two full scenes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to get the setup. Then we go to Steve Martin's The Underpants, and he gets right into it like within right. the first few sentences. So it's kind of all over the board. <laughs> right. right, right, right. You know? right. Well, yeah. I'm asking because um, you could stage it in your living room. Now there's an idea. I love that. You know, get a few friends who <laughs> would mind and kind of do, you know, the short, you know, do do a few of them, like have an evening of like, we're going to try three, three set up for three of these plays and it's going to be fun. 
Okay, I love that. Instead yeah. of reading through stuff, we'll do yeah. it. I love that. Thanks. Yeah, I think you're going to really, really, really get a feeling for what it is because you'll stage it. Love it. Yeah. Thank Yay. you. Any questions, folks, feel free to raise your hand or put something in the chat. Or we can just work until somebody has a question. <laughs> I have plenty to do. Looks like we have a question from Larry. Hey, Larry. Hey, SLP. Hey. Um, I uh, I got something. Uh, I sometimes uh, fight. Uh, I'm not letting it stop me, but I sometimes one of my sensors that goes off that sometimes can um stop my writing or is i get um afraid judgmental about being cute <laughs> or clever so like i've been working on a section you know I, I think i mentioned that i'm in i'm trying to edit and get take the work that i have and put it into a format and i'm finding it a somewhat useful tool to have parallel scenes that go back and forth and sort of talk to each other mm -hmm. and kind of like um i always sort of admire the way um like uh tony kushner does that in angels in america a lot and things like that where the mm -hmm. scenes talk to each other and i'm finding myself that i it, it i don't know it gets cute um because um 
even sometimes without my trying, I'll be like, oh, that line sort of echoes that line. Mm -hmm. and I, I then start to feel like the, the cleverness of the structure is louder than the content or that it's too wink, wink, see what I did there. Um, and I get, um, I don't know how sometimes, it's sort of like in life when you don't know if you're making a ego-based decision or a humble decision, you don't mm -hmm. can't uh -huh. tell the difference. Uh -huh. and so sometimes my writer ego is tickled with something, some verbal jousting that I'm doing. Um, and I don't know if I'm um, if I'm creating a distraction or if that's actually good storytelling. Right. So I just wonder if you had right. uh, that's right. been on my mind and I didn't know how to word right. it. But. That's no, that's a that's a great question, Larry. It's it's tricky because you know, aren't we allowed to have fun when we write? You know what yeah. I mean? Or does it all have to be like, uh, you know? Um, are are we allowed? Aren't we allowed to have a nice time? <laughs> You know, and if if doing sort of jokes or clever, cute, fun things is gives you pleasure, then I would just say keep doing it. And maybe in a, you know, the next draft, you might look back on it and go, eh, maybe I don't need that anymore. You know, yeah. um, but definitely if if it's enjoyable, and if you're having it's enjoyable to you, right now you're the only one looking at it you know so i think please yourself you know but be make it fun for yourself especially if it keeps you going you right know? and then right. and then maybe next draft you might not need that anymore you know like we you know i don't know maybe when we were you know t five years old we needed a you know I don't know, a little toy to carry around to make us feel happy. And then when we became, you know, 25, we didn't need it anymore. You know, I mean, I, I, I think it's okay. Um, I would hate to say no fun. And it has to be all, you know, <laughs> serious writing. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, because sometimes you just got to get through the day and write something that makes you feel like this is fine. It, it, it might be the same feeling that you have, um, when someone when one of we're, we're writing or working and we're writing and we're going this sucks right well so what keep writing you know right it's like keep writing thing keep going keep going you can fix it later if it still feels clever in a bad way the fourth time around then you might cut it right you know? okay that makes sense yeah it's yeah it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that it's that the question is not stopping you, you know. Um, that's good. That's good. Um yeah, not not to worry about that, I don't think. Okay. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. God. Yeah, yeah. Just like we don't worry about if if we know in the back of our mind, ah, eh, this isn't the best the narrative isn't really falling together like I want it to, or that character isn't totally figured out like i know she should be <laughs> keep you know just keep going fix it later you know yeah that's good okay thank, thank you. you thanks larry
Looks like we have another question for um, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Hey, thanks. Um, uh, there's, um, I guess, a twofold matter. One has to do, again, in, in a practical sense, um, and I can always go to the website, I know, with, with, with the public theater and the like, but I'll call it. But when you're, when you're looking at, at, at um, New York theater and the like and, and, and mounting work and the like and submitting and, mm -hmm. that, and that whole process, um, and, and as a Dramatist Guild member, I mean, there are a number of resources. Um, so I'm, I'm clear about that. Um, but when you were first starting out as, as a writer, did you did you submit to a number of different places with your work as you were looking to, um, you know, mount work and to get work up? I'm just curious about that process. And you mentioned the new works at the public theater. Right. And right. right. Yeah, I submitted to lots of different places. Um, that did lots of different, you know, I mean, I would go to theaters and go, hmm, that place does work that feels like mine. So maybe I'll submit there, you know, and I'd look up on, you know, whatever information they had. And back then it was something called the Dramatist Source Book, I think. It was this big, thick book, like a telephone book. Um, and I'd look up and I'd send plays to to them. Or I'd I'd maybe hear... Uh, if it was out of town and I'd hear of uh, somebody who'd gotten a play done that felt kind of cool, like a felt like my play. And so I would send a, a play to them. Um, but I was sending plays, my, work to a lot of different places, you know, that specialize in lots of different kinds of work. Um, um, and I don't know so much the submission process today. I do think that individual theaters would have their own kind of criteria, you know, what it would be but I was sort of like I'll send my work to anybody you know um I wasn't too too worried or picky about about who should get something because you never know you know yeah you never know um so yeah that's that's a, that's what I'd say to that okay um, and also in DC again in DC you know you have theater you have some cool theaters there arena woolly mammoth you know was it studio theater i think yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the, i mean those are the three i know just off the top of my head those are just great places to do stuff um yeah. and then probably a whole bunch of other ones that i'm not familiar with right off the top of my head but right right one of the things now in terms of the work um one of the thank you for that um sure. um because this is a historical piece of um um and and in many ways, I, I I suppose not to be sophomoric or glib, but I guess Top Dog has a historical context inherently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for its um, narrative mm -hmm. arc. Um, it's been curious to look at uh, this driving engine incident of sorts which was actually a, a life that was taken, a, mm. an actual person whose life was taken, uh -huh. and consequent historical facts with respect to um, the, the, the legal matters and, and other things that happen and, and noteworthy folks. I yeah. find it curious to um, find those interstitial spaces, those imaginative spaces, um, even someone mentioned angels, so Roy Cohn, to take individuals who are noted, if you will, in terms of cultural awareness in, in our history, human history, and then to find those spaces with, when, with which you trust yourself to give them voice to me. And one mm -hmm. of the things that's been curious to me is to determine, okay, do I wish to maintain the factual names of these people? Mm. Or is it more apropos of what I'm attempting to do allegorically and to deal with by giving them, by taking the circumstances and the new circumstances I'm conceiving based on what happened and, and yet 
And so I've even read the play most recently. It was really more kind of an anxiety thing. And I changed all the names of the story and I just uh -huh. gave them substitute names. Right. I found that to be very interesting in terms of following their needs, their tragic flaws, their, their you know, all the things they were dealing with without the onus of the history mm -hmm. in dealing with whatever I was grappling with as I'm going through the engine of mm -hmm. my concerns with these people and their um their needs, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, ha have you ever contended with such questions in your own work where you're like, hmm, I wonder, do I stick with these individuals in fact and what they're doing? Or has it ever created a conundrum for you in the concept of dealing with people wanting and needing things between each other in the circumstances? Right, you mean your cha characters. When you say people wanting and needing things, your characters, right? My character, yeah, the yeah, character. Yeah, That's yeah. It, it, it's, it's yeah. tricky. I would say, Steve, do whatever is going to be most helpful. You know, so again, if changing the names of the of the characters, you know, moving away from their historical names to a made up a name that you make up yeah. um, makes it more uh, pleasurable, more possible, anyway, for you to get it written, do that because I'm sure the story is going to be compelling. And then you could say it's based on, you know, you know, this thing. You could always say that. Um, I would really say, you know, really make the choice for yourself that's going to make it the most possible for you to get it written. Um, I write about historical people all the time. And I, you know, I just, and people say, well, that person never would have said that. Well, you know, there's a, a yeah. how you know how you know, how you know, you know what I mean um, I mean even even if I mean I've written you know a TV show about Aretha Franklin you know and that, you know we, and we work closely with the family of course but there were moments that you know people said well would she have ever said that and I said well it makes sense it's plausible you know what I mean we're not trying to shove words into a historical character's throat to prove our point. Never that. So you have to be very uh, humble in a way. Yeah, yeah. You know, in your interaction with a historical person, because they should be leading, and you should be listening as much as possible. You should be listening. You you've already got a historical record, right? Yeah. What you're listening for is the stuff between the cracks. And that's what you got to hear. That's why you're writing about them, because all of history, you know, hasn't been recorded. And most of it has, that's been recorded is in service of oftentimes some bullshit. So you're here to bear witness to what what hasn't been recorded. Yeah. Right? And um, but if it helps you to change their names, change their names. You know, go for it. It's been curious. You mean there've been these moments where, because there's a court, court reality, a, a, you know, U.S. court reality, and and sometimes I'm like, hmm, to what extent would I even allow for the the word of record that's in the record from 1960s to inform this moment? And so there there've been moments like that, you know, even even, and, and I'll even go so far as there's another moment in, in a scene in which there's a hymn, there are hymns sung, and I've done the research around the hymns. Mm -hmm. And 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 I'm like, hmm, this is a, you know, when I think about August Wilson and I think about some of the beauties I've enjoyed of August Wilson's work, sometimes it's just a moment like in the piano when they're just singing, but it's an original song piece. It's not like, and so, you know, I'm, you know, we're conscious of that in the work. Okay, do I take from the tone of this hymn and conceive of another hymn as opposed to the, a, a hymn that's familiar, you know, like, uh -huh. Uh -huh. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I always say make the choice that makes it writable. You know, because I, I'm sure that the story will be compelling, even if we don't know the actual historical, you know, you know, I, I really do think the story will be compelling. Thanks. Um, because, which is another way of saying, hopefully this, the only reason the story is compelling isn't because 
it really happened. <laughs> you know what I mean? It really happened. Okay, great. You know, but you're going to make it dramatically compelling, which is different from historically accurate. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Understood. Cool, cool. Thank you, Steve. Awesome. We have just a couple of minutes left. Um, so, yeah, no, no one has a question. I will just let you all know that we are here next Monday, the Monday after and the Monday after. And all of those sign up sheets are on the public theater website. Um, so feel free to sign up, tell your friends about about it, tell them to sign up. You can always watch on HowlRound. Um, so spread the word and we hope to see you back here for the next three Mondays at least. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thank and you all. Nice that you have your background back. Oh, yeah. true. <laughs> we missed it last week. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But thank you all. Yeah. We'll see you next week. See you next week, everyone. Thank you.